Well, a year ago, who would have guessed that words like Erebus, Philae, and blue light-emitting diode would make global headlines? Well, they did. And behind every one of those words is a story of wonder. And that's why The National's Bob McDonald counts them among the 10 best science stories of 2014. Hey, Bob. Hi, Paul. So, you're not ranking these. What are, what are we about uh, to hear? No, I, I don't like to do that. I, I don't like to say one story is better than another because they're all amazing to me. And this is my personal list of 10 stories that really caught my eye this year. You'll hear other lists from other people, and that's great. I mean, because there's so much going on. Everybody has their own take. So this is my personal one. All right, let's get this off the launch pad <laughs> with the discovery of a new planet. Yes, indeed. Five, four, three, two, engine start, one, zero, and liftoff of the Delta II rocket with Kepler on a search for planets in some way like our own. <laughs> I, I love those superlatives that they always do at launches, you know, <laughs> off into the vastness of no one's gone before. But the Kepler satellite was astounding. It went up and it looked at one piece of sky not far from the Milky Way to try to see if there are any planets going around other stars. And it found thousands of them. In fact, now we think that there are planets around every star that you can see in the night sky. But one really stood out because it's most like us. It's called uh, Kepler 186F. And it's one of the few that Kepler found that's actually like the Earth. It's just a little bigger than we are, and it's in what they call the Goldilocks zone of its star. It's not too close, it's not too far away, not too hot, not too cold. It's in the range, like the Earth, where water could exist on its surface. So this may be the one that uh, is like ourselves out there, and that's why everybody's so excited about it. Sort of in that sweet spot they talk that's about. Right. Too. Like, so what is Earth like? mean? Well, it means that there could be life on it. There could be water on it. Now, we don't know that yet. There's still a lot of work to do to find out what kind of chemistry is in its atmosphere. But even if there is, even if there's intelligent life, even if there are people there, if we want to talk to them, it's 500 light years away from here. That means that a radio signal to say hello will take 500 years just to get there. And if they want to answer us, it'll take another 500 years for them to say yeah, what do you want? <laughs> so, well, but 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 you always think, so if, can we, will we ever know? How, how would we find out? Well, we're going to find out with more telescopes, and uh, we're going to find more planets. Uh, Kepler mission, uh, there are still uh, ground-based telescopes that are going to try to verify others, and maybe we'll find some that are closer. So it's all up to the people on the ground now to uh, look at those planets from a distance. We don't have the ability to go there yet. Okay, from deep space to deep underground in a cave in Mexico. This is a remarkable discovery in the Yucatan. Some divers in a cave came across a skeleton of a teenage girl that is now believed to be 12 to 13,000 years old. It's the most complete skeleton ever found. Not only did they find her bones, but they found some DNA within her bones. And that's really important because they were able to use that DNA to trace her heritage back. And uh, they call her Naya, which is uh, named after a water nymph from uh, <laughs> Greek mythology. But uh, there's the cave. Look at how huge this thing is. 12,000 years ago, she fell into that cave. And uh, she had some broken pelvis, I think. And uh, she also fell in with a saber-toothed cat, uh, <laughs> some bears, and a whole bunch of other animals that had fallen into this pit in the ground. But thanks to her, they were able to trace back the origin of First Nations people in North America. And she confirmed that they did indeed come from Beringia. And I think we have a graphic that shows the land bridge that used to exist uh, before the last ice age when sea levels were lower. They came from Asia across into North America and as far down as Mexico. Now, there's been a lot of debate about that. Um, many First Nations people say, no, we've always been here. Other people thought, well, maybe people came from Europe or Polynesia. But she proved genetically that indeed at least her line did come from Asia. Okay, from a discovery in Mexico to one in Canada. Yes, indeed. Some very good news, and that is that uh, we have found one of the two Franklin ships. I never thought I'd have the Prime Minister in a science story, but anyway, <laughs> this was a remarkable discovery after, uh, since 
1845, when Sir Franklin left on a quest to find the Northwest Passage, uh, his ship was caught in the ice uh, for more than two years. Uh, his crew was lost, and the search has been on for his ship ever since. And other people have died looking for it. And this year, it's a remarkable Canadian story of our technology, our side scan sonar that found the ship sitting upright, almost entirely intact, in only 11 meters of water. It's astounding. Why, why was it in such it. good shape? I've always wondered. Well, it's because the water in the north is so cold that bacterial action is really, really slow. So you don't get the same kind of decay in the rotting of the wood. And that's why they're hoping that perhaps if they get inside the ship and it seems to be structurally strong enough, divers or robots could actually get in there. Maybe we'll find the bones of Franklin himself, find out what actually happened. Maybe we'll find papers of his trip and, and find documentation of what actually went on. Uh, now, from this point, they actually have to try to find the other ship as well, because there was two. There was the Erebus, which he was on, and the Terror, the other one. What, what's also amazing about this story is that ice had a role to play in it. It was ice that doomed Franklin's ship in 1846, but during this year's search, they were actually looking in an area northern, in a northern part where they thought the ship was, but the ice was in this year and pushed them south. So it was serendipity that the ice actually led them to the ship. The next story is a familiar one to many. I've been reporting on it uh, this month, climate change. You bet. This clearly shows that we have a very limited window of opportunity and I think the global community must look at these numbers and show the resolve by which we can bring about change. You know, Paul, I've been doing stories on climate change since 1976. Scientists have been waving about this for a long time, and this is the first time this year that the United Nations, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, came out with really strong language and said, look, it's not an uncertainty anymore. It's no, no longer, we may be influencing the climate. We are influencing the climate scientifically. There's no longer a debate. It's real. It's now. Let's get off the pot and do something about it. And that's why they're gearing up. You know, we had uh, talks in Lima this year. We're leading up to Paris and saying, we really, really need to do something about this. And Canada's kind of dragging its feet on this. We're, we're criticized in the international community. Our emissions are still going up. And I think it's good that the science is finally saying, let's be strong about it and, and let's really move forward because we're reaching a tipping point where if we don't do something about it, it's going to get even worse. All right, this next one is about star power. Here comes the sun spot. <laughs> <laughs> this was a very active year for the sun. Uh, in one month, in October, it had six flares on its surface, and these are enormous storms. Uh, you can see that dark group there in the center. Now, the sun does go through a natural cycle every 11 years when it gets really active like this, and it's actually coming out of that cycle right now, so it should be going quiet. But this year was just amazing. We had these huge flares, some of them blasting X-rays out. Fortunately, they did not spit at us. Sometimes the sun throws huge blobs of, of charged particles that hit the Earth and knock out our satellites and interfere with our communication systems. We didn't get that, but we did get an amazing year of northern lights. And what's astounding about this is that we saw them coming. There's now space weather reports. <laughs> we have satellites in space that watch the sun all the time, and they're putting out satellite weather reports. So we know, hey, there's a flare coming, you know, hard enough. <laughs> Get those astronauts into the center of the space station. Don't do a spacewalk. So that's part of our weather report now coming from space as well as on the ground. But not harmful. These ones were not harmful. These ones were not harmful, but they can be. It all depends on which way the sun is pointing. If it's pointing straight at us, we can get hit. And now we can see them coming and prepare. Okay, our last story before the break, the dream of you and I, private space travel. Gone wrong. We had two terrible accidents in one week. Uh, this one from Orbital Sciences, an unmanned rocket on its way up to the space station uh, had a very poor launch. Its uh, engine exploded, the entire thing was destroyed. Uh, that rocket happened to be using old Russian rockets that were uh, left over from the Cold War. Uh, they're going to stop using those right now. And then the second one was the manned spacecraft uh, Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2. And unfortunately, one of the pilots was killed in this. This is the one that Sir Richard Branson is hoping to take tourists up on flights to space for $250,000 a seat. And they were getting ready to fly this thing next year, and Branson himself was going to be on the first flight. Unfortunately, um, I think it might have been pilot error that caused the, uh, the tail to come up early and uh, the whole thing just broke apart. So what they have to do now is prove that it's safe. They have to um, retest these devices just like uh, after an airline crash. 
you know, there has to be an investigation. What went wrong? How do we make sure it doesn't happen again? And convince the public and the aviation authorities that it is well, safe. Well, convince indeed. I mean, pilot error is not the thing you want to hear in these yeah, kinds of things. What kind of a setback is this for? Oh, it'll probably set them back several years because they'll have to retest. They have to rebuild the spacecraft. They have others in the garage that they were building and uh, do a proper investigation. But I think they will. I think they will, because space tourism is a real thing. And in the same way that after there's an airline crash, which, by the way, are mostly pilot error, they do find out what went wrong, say, OK, that's not going to happen again, and you move on. You don't stop. So we, it's a setback, but not a cancellation. We've got to go to the break, but one word answer, would you go, yes or no? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> in absolutely. Flash, I'd go in a flash. They're now going to be the safest thing ever, because they're <laughs> going to find out what went wrong and make sure it doesn't happen again. <laughs> OK, Bob, stay where you are. Uh, we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, lights, comet, and cloning action. And we're back. Have we talked about your favorite science story of the year yet? Well, we're not done. National science correspondent Bob McDonald has been filling us in on some of his top picks, and it's time to hand out a prize. Big one. This year's prize is about light. The 2014 Nobel Prize in Physics to Professor Isamo Akasaki, Professor Hiroshi Amano, and Professor Judy Nakamura for the invention of efficient blue light emitting diodes. You know, sometimes it's the little things that count, you know. Our, our <laughs> Light-emitting diodes. I mean, they've been around forever. We've had them forever. We've had red ones and green ones, but we haven't had blue. Well, that's what I thought. Like, yeah. I thought this isn't new. Come right? on, they're all over the place. Well, the Nobel Prizes are given out for scientific discoveries that have a big impact on society later on, okay? So they weren't invented this year. Huh. But the problem is that in order to get white, you need three colors. You need red, green, and blue for, for transmitting. And Red and green are really easy. So light-emitting diodes are just crystals that you apply a little bit of electricity to and they glow. So they can get green and they could get red, but blue they found they couldn't get the right formula. And what these three uh, scientists did, they came up with gallium nitride. Anyway, so they, they played around with gallium and they found that they actually got blue. Because of that, we now have white LED lights. And the thing about LED lights is that they're very, very low energy. They're super efficient. A normal light bulb, a condescent bulb, only about 5% of the energy that you put into that bulb is light. The rest of it's heat. That's why they're so hot. You can't touch them, right? It's all heat. So they're, they're wasteful. That's why we don't use them much anymore. LEDs, more than half the energy is light. So that means that for developing countries that don't have a lot of electricity or people can't pay for it, these lights can make a huge difference. It gives us the LED flashlights. It gives us, it gives us cheap light. It gives us plasma television sets. And, and so many, the LEDs are in so many things now, we don't even think about them. And I, I just think it was really neat that they were honored for such a simple invention that applies in so many different ways. I'm going to quote you on that. Really neat. Yeah. Uh, we've got one animal <laughs> on the list this year, and it's extinct. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Everything is melting. Oh, oh, oh. I just heard you're going extinct. I'm not going extinct. Look, the last mammoth. Whoa. Well, meet Buttercup. Uh, Buttercup <laughs> is a woolly mammoth who was pulled out of the Siberian ice last year. Now, she's not the first mammoth to be pulled out. Uh, they've been doing this for quite a while, but what's amazing about Buttercup is that she was so fresh, her meat was still red and there was still blood. No and kidding. Uh, because of that, they were able to extract some of her blood, and what they're hoping for is to get some DNA out of that blood. And if they can, if they can find her complete genome, which is difficult because DNA is a very long molecule that tends to break up, they think they might be able to clone her. And the way they would do that is take the DNA, put it into an egg of a living elephant, and then that elephant becomes the surrogate mother who would then give birth to an, clone, actual... an actual woolly mammoth. The mother's going to be very confused. <laughs> What's with this hairy kid? But scientifically, it would be the first time that we've done sort of a Jurassic Park, of bringing back an animal. Now, this is only 12,000 years old, not 60 million. But it raises some interesting questions. Should we do that? Should we do it? Scientifically, it would be really neat to see an extinct animal in the flesh to be able to study it. But that's going to be one lonely mammoth, because it'll be the only one of its kind. And if we were to try to, say, bring back a whole herd, where, where would they live? Because their environment doesn't exist anymore. So where would we put them? So there's some interesting ethical questions. Maybe it would be interesting to do it once, but I think we should take care of the animals on their way to extinction rather than the ones that are already extinct. From the ancient past to the future, 
and Mars. And liftoff at dawn, the dawn of Orion and a new era of American space exploration. Another huge <laughs> superlative. <laughs> I, uh, this Orion capsule that they sent, uh, yeah, it went 5,000 kilometers up, turned around, came back, and splashed down in the ocean under parachutes. Gee, it reminded me of 1968. Exactly. You know, when we were going to the moon in capsules exactly like that. Um, the Americans are all excited about it because this is their first spacecraft that's their own since the shuttles were retired, and they want to stop hitchhiking rides on the Russian Soyuz rockets, which they've had, had to do in the past. But they're a long, long way from Mars. This is only the capsule that will carry the crew, for crew. Uh, there's a big rocket that has yet to be built to carry Orion into space. That's not completed. And if they want to go to Mars, there's another spaceship that the, they have to live in on the way there. That hasn't been built yet. So there's still a long, long way to go. I think there was more hype over this than it deserved. Yes, I was in Florida when that uh, lifted off, and I slept in. I missed it. I kicked myself. <laughs> oh, no. You didn't want to rank these, uh, but do you have a favorite? Well, yeah. My, my uh, best story of the year, I think was most astounding, was the European Rosetta mission to a comet. So we are sitting on the surface, Phila is talking to us, more data to come out and to be analyzed right now. This was an astounding accomplishment. Sending a robot that took 10 years just to get to the comet, and then once it landed, it bounced three times, uh, didn't quite hang on like it was supposed to, ended up in a shadow, which is too bad, but they still got almost 90% of the science out of it. Uh, this thing told us that uh, the comet contains organic chemicals, which is the same stuff you and I are made of. Here's a picture that it took. It's right up against a wall. That's a wall of ice. And uh, this mission, a lot of people think it was a failure because its batteries died and it had to go to sleep, but it may come back to life. As the comet comes around the sun, that shadow may move, and its mothership that carried it there, that's still in orbit around the comet, is still working. It's going to work for another year. Uh, we've never done anything like that. Gone to a comet. This comet is going to change over the next year. It's going to get close to the sun. It's going to develop a tail. It's going to snow up. It's going to start giving snow. It'll come out of geysers and come up and blow out into space. We're going to see that happen in real time. And it's an astounding accomplishment of the European Space Agency, which we don't hear of very much. So, it's the stuff out of Hollywood, really. Oh, I mean, almost literally, right? Yeah. We've seen movies about this stuff. Absolutely. And uh, I, I just keep your eye on it. There's still more to come from Philae. It's not dead yet. Bob, as always, a great list. Uh, next year, can we include a visit from aliens? You never know. You never know. <laughs> Thanks, and have a happy new year. Okay, the Nationals Paul's... science correspondent, Bob McDonald. We have to take a quick break, but stay with us.